Dear friends and investors, welcome again for our monthly update on investments and markets. This month, as usual, being a results season, we will take stock of the trends of the third quarterly numbers. We think that it is important that while the narrative in the markets is very positive and bullish, uh, it's very easy to get carried away and therefore we always continue to monitor and keep an eye on the overall earnings trends uh, for the top 500 companies which is where we really get our conviction and confidence that uh, you know our bullishness and our positive stance on the markets is backed up by earnings as well. Similarly uh, Given the early trends, I think the earnings season is about halfway through. We will also talk about the trends that we see in some of the sectors where the companies have declared their earnings. And specifically, we will speak of some positions or portfolios, companies which have already announced the earnings and which are part uh, of our investment portfolios as well. So coming to the aggregate picture so far, if you look at the top 500 companies, roughly about 45% or 146 companies have declared their results. And the trend that we see is very similar to what we saw in Q2, a very moderate growth in top line. So the top line was up about 5% approximately. But the bottom line growth continues to be robust and the aggregate bottom line growth was about 33%. So we continue to see very strong year-on-year -year growth. Uh, the top line growth looks moderate because there is still some inflation in last year's top line, but we continue to see margin improvement and hence the operating leverage continues to be very favorable. And if you were to look at X banks, that is out of the 146 companies, if you remove the banks and financials, and if you look at just the 103 companies, and the picture is pretty similar, 3% year on year top line growth, but a 36.5% growth in PAT year on year. So I think the trend that we have been seeing in Q1, Q2, and even in Q3, is that we are seeing in excess of 30% bottom line growth for a broad section of companies. As I said, we've already covered half of it and we will, as the earnings season progresses, tell you what the final picture will also look like, hopefully next month. Now coming to some specific sectors, we first start with the auto and auto components and by and large the third quarter has been a little bit of a mixed bag with the OEMs doing slightly better than the auto component companies. And the standout OEMs were so far that have reported were Bajaj and TVS. Uh, both have done exceptionally well, of which we own TVS. And TVS was able to grow EBITDA at 40% year on year. And this was despite an unfavorable mix because exports is still pretty uh, is soft uh, and uh, despite that we've seen a margin expansion so there has been a very good control on costs and productivity. Uh, they also mentioned that they've seen a slight improvement in rural demand and that's because they've seen a little bit of a pickup in mopeds but we'll have to wait and see whether this is a sustainable trend. Uh, TVS continues to grow uh, uh, robustly, they plan to open at least 400 new touch points over the next few months. And we believe that given the very strong portfolio of ICE engines uh, and, and a razor focus on margins, that the company should be able to deliver strong numbers despite the EV portfolio still dragging the overall profitability. Coming to capital goods, a sector which has Tremendous tailwinds, continues to do both well uh, as far as the results are concerned, order books are concerned and also stock performance. Um, in our case, the only company that seems to have 
come out with results is Hitachi Energy. Uh, Hitachi had a very healthy order book, gross margins were sustained at 35 percent and EBITDA margins expanded by about 150 basis points year over year to about 5 percent. Now we, we believe though there has been an improvement in the EBITDA margins, but it is not to the level where we think the potential of the company is and the company has guided that in next year that is FY25 they are aiming to achieve a double digit 10 percent EBITDA margins. We believe it is eminently possible as some of the large order books gets executed and the old low margin business gets booked in the large part of this year. As you know the company had a very large high voltage DC project in Mumbai that they won in Q1 of last year and that will be executed over the next 12 to 15 months and the revenue visibility continues to be very solid at 22 months of uh, sales. Coming to LNT, uh, it has been one of our top holdings for a while. Uh, they have increased their order inflow uh, guidance which obviously is very very positive. Um, and while top line and order inflow were higher than estimated, there was a slight disappointment on the margin front. Uh, however, the company is quite confident that in the fourth quarter and progressively going forward, the margin should improve. The opportunity set for LNT continues to be very, very robust, both from an oil and gas uh, export perspective as well as the infrastructure uh, uh, projects in India and the total order prospects are almost higher by 50 percent at 6 lakh crores. So, the opportunity set for Larsen remains and continues to remain very, very robust. Now coming to the IT and the ERD companies, uh, this quarter as well the trend was very clear that the ERD companies continue to grow faster than the IT service companies uh, and that gap continues whether, whether you look at it on a year on year or a quarter on quarter basis. Um, at the same time from a margin perspective, uh, a few of the companies stood out uh, amongst the one that we own Persistent Systems and KPIT both were able to expand margins Q on Q. Uh, Tata LXE had a slight dip, but their overall margins continue to be industry leading. Our feeling is that uh, the structural growth in the ERD companies will continue, their lead should continue, but at the same time we also believe that it seems like that the general IT spending softness seems to be bottoming out and therefore it won't be surprising if the general IT services companies also start showing uh, better numbers uh, starting a couple of quarters down the line. Now coming specifically to persistent, again in Q3 they had industry leading revenue growth, uh, very strong deal signings and an 80 basis point improvement in margins and persistent continues to show industry leading growth and we also believe is way ahead when it comes to capturing the wave of AI tech spending. Secondly, Tata LXE are long term holding and a structural play on ERND. Uh, I would say gave satisfactory numbers. The auto vertical was a little soft than what we expected, but that was largely because there was uh, a ramp up in one order which will now happen in Q4 instead of Q3, so hopefully that get, gets uh, catched up. And they continue to deliver industry uh, leading margins. The healthcare vertical did phenomenally well but the media and communication vertical for LXE still continues to be quite flattish. If we look at the stock prices of Netflix, 
uh, you will see that Netflix has surprised on the upside. Uh, too early to say whether that lead indicator should finally translate into higher spending growth by the media and communication vertical. But at least some of the OTT companies in the US have started to do better than what the investors expected. So we will wait and watch and see if that has a salutary effect on LXE's numbers as well. Coming to KPIT, I think one of the very few companies in the industry which have consistently upgraded their guidance and have also met it. And this quarter too, KPIT was able to show uh, better growth than expectations. Uh, they continue to maintain their guidance of a 37% year-on-year growth for the full year and EBITDA margins in excess of 20%. We believe that given the kind of growth they have given in Q3, they will easily meet their guidance for this financial year and we would wait to see what guidance they give at the end of next quarter for the next year as well. Now having said that, I think I must mention here that our bet on the ERND companies uh, has been, has turned out to be quite right. These companies continue to grow. But we must be careful that the burden of expectations is now on these companies and there is no error uh, for execution at all because they are all now trading at fairly rich multiples and therefore we will be quite careful about uh, monitoring the performance. Uh, there is no room for error at current valuations. Coming to one of the largest sectors in the market which is banks and NBFCs. As you all know that we have an exposure uh, to some of the high quality franchises in the lending business uh, by way of our exposure to Bajaj Finance, ICICI Bank and SBFC. So I'll talk about all of this. But before that, if you look at the trends of the results that have come so far, clearly there are some headwinds that we see. A, we've seen that the cost of funds has gone up for everybody. Uh, you know, ga gathering deposits has been a tough task and the cost of funds have gone up anywhere from 7 basis points to almost 28 basis points in that range for various lenders. Sporadically, we've also seen in some segments that credit costs also has started to inch up, though nothing to worry. But I think there are sporadic instances where credit costs have also started to inch up. Um, if you look at ICICI Bank, uh, again, you know, there were no complaints as far as the Q3 numbers were concerned. It continues to be the best run private sector large bank in the country. Um, Having said that, uh, we believe that the lending business is seeing some headwinds and the headwinds as I mentioned is coming because of the challenge to raise deposits, there is pressure on margins and there is a sporadic increase in credit costs. And if you look at the way the RBI regulations have also been moving. Uh, and the last few uh, steps that the RBI has taken, it clearly tells you that the RBI wants to slow down the personal loan or the unsecured lending business. And as you know that most lenders in this cycle wanted to lend to retail and the profitability actually improves when you do unsecured lending. But if the RBI is going to put on the brakes, then I think we're going to see an additional challenge in terms of growth and margins. And therefore, we believe that from a portfolio positioning perspective, we've taken a call to reduce our exposure to the lending segment, right? And therefore, we have exited our investments in ICICI Bank. As I said, there's nothing wrong with the results. I think it's a very well-run franchise. 
but we believe that unless and until these headwinds recede, we do not want to have a large exposure to the lending businesses. Similarly, while we have been holding Bajaj for a fairly long period of time in the NBFC space and Bajaj has been executing brilliantly well, we have at the margin trimmed our exposure to Bajaj as well. If you look at Bajaj's uh, this quarter numbers, uh, while growth continues to be solid at 35 percent uh, from an AUM perspective, uh, they also mentioned that the recent RBI strictures on dispersal of new loans through e-commerce and Insta EMI cards did create uh, some impact on growth in this quarter. And therefore, while we believe that and we continue to believe that Bajaj is a very, very solid franchise that we believe that Bajaj can still compound profits at 25 percent plus. Uh, we believe that overall in the lending space, given the kind of challenges that we are seeing in the near to medium term, we have decided that we will trim our exposure a little bit and we will not have a very large overweight position like we have had historically. Coming to a new lender that we have in the portfolio over the last few quarters is SBFC. Now SBFC is a lender to the MSME segment and it only does secured lending, right? So all its lending is secured against property or real estate. This is an area which actually the RBI and the central bank and the government wants to encourage. But more importantly, I think our bet is not only on the fact that there is a significant growth opportunity in the MSME lending space, but we particularly like the management of SPFC. And I can say this with confidence having been an early investor in Bajaj Finance and being very impressed by Rajiv Jain very early in the way he thought about the business and the way he went on executing on the plan of Bajaj Finance. Very similarly, we have very high respect for Asim Dhru. He is a very hands-on, conservative, uh, sensible entrepreneur. He knows what he is doing and he is executing brilliantly on the ground. And when you look at the numbers of SBFC, you will see that despite other financials having pressure on margins, SBFC actually improved margins, right? It had the best quarterly ROA of 4.3 percent, NIMS expanded and margins improved because of operational efficiencies. Um, we believe that SBFC is successfully navigating the rising rate cycle and it is quite evident that the cumulative yield has improved by 114 basis points over the first nine months and the costs have only gone up by 60 basis points and thereby we have seen that even in a rising rate cycle they have been able to manage their margins fairly well. The AUM growth has been 40 percent year on year versus a management guidance of between 20 to 28 percent. So here we believe that we are again encountering a opportunity in the lending space which is relatively young, undiscovered, where we believe that the management quality is top notch and the execution is top notch. So in summary, uh, we believe that we would want to restrict our exposure to the lending space given the near to medium term headwinds and we will continue to scan for opportunities in this space and once we believe that the headwinds are priced in or are out of the way, we would think of increasing our exposure. Till then, 
we plan to redeploy the money that has come out of financials to some of the other sectors and companies where we see a significant opportunity. With that, I end this month's communication. Until next month, thank you.